Hello everybody and welcome to our second live event of SC2X, Supply Chain Design. Here is with me Akash Regengar. Hi, Akash. Hi everyone, hope everyone's doing great. Uh, yeah, welcome to the second live event. Uh, we're almost reaching the midway of the course. Uh, so yeah, excited to have you all here. Awesome, thank you. So basically uh, what we'd like to cover in the, in the next uh, hour or so is the following. I'm gonna start giving an overview of the, the, of the meter exam. So basically I'm gonna be describing what you should expect for this meter and also uh, giving some, uh, some rules about uh, the meter. Then the main uh, part of this live event is gonna be, uh, we're gonna be solving some problems from past exam. Basically we're gonna be solving two problems. One, it's about network design and the second one, it's about a fixed planning horizon model. And after solving those problems, we're gonna, we're gonna be opening the room for any questions that you might have regarding the content of the exam, but also any uh, logistic questions that you might have about the meter exam. Without further ado, let, let us start. And for that, let me share my, my screen. Okay, awesome. Okay, great. So we'll start with the, the overview of the meter exam. So the meter exam is an open boot e exam. So this means that you can use any material that you have for this uh, from, from the course. So this means that you can use the, the videos or you can use the slide, or even you can use the Excel that you have created or the SAS script that you have created. So everything that you have available, you can use it during, during the, the exam. Second thing is, uh, let me highlight that this, the, the goal of this exam is to assess your knowledge. So basically it's a means for us to know where you are in terms of gaining the, the knowledge. In this sense, we are not providing any feedback during the test. So basically you, you won't see the typical uh, check check or the, 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 right, the right sign that you have for the GAs that won't be provided during the, during the test. Okay, so no feedback will provide during the test. And also we're not gonna be providing the solutions after we close the, the test. Remember that this exam is only uh, for assessing your, your knowledge. So yeah, just to emphasize, even after the exam is closed, um, if you got, if you, anyone reaches out uh, asking for solutions or where they went wrong, uh, please know that we will not be able to provide this uh, on any platform. Correct, it's not an opportunity for learning, it's just a means for us to assess where you are. Okay, regarding the, the timing, so the meter exam will open tomorrow. So that's uh, December 4th at the usual time, 1500 UTC. And it will remain open for one week. That means that we are gonna be closing this a meter exam on December 11 at the same time, 1500 UTC. So this means that the meter exam is gonna be available for one week. But keep in mind that this is a time exam, meaning that you will have only a limited time to complete. So basically, you're gonna be having four hours to complete uh, this test. So this means that when you click the start button, you will have only four hours to finish the, the test. Okay, but the exam is gonna be open for one, one week. In order to have the complete four hours, please start at least four hours before the, the deadline. Okay, and with that, let me, um, let me go um, and, and ask you the first, the first question. And what I want to ask you is, when do you plan to take this exam? And the options that I have for you are before the weekend. weekend. So that means uh, Wednesday, Thursday or Friday during the weekend, Sunday, Saturday or Sunday, and finally after the weekend, that will be the last days, Monday, Tuesday, or even Wednesday. Okay, so we have started collecting some of your uh, inputs already 20, 20 responses. So some of you are saying that you're planning to take before the weekend, some of you after the weekend, but the vast majority, at least uh, three quarters of you are saying that you are planning to take the, fan, the exam during the, the weekend. Okay, I think that's a good, I would say that's a good time to, to take the exam. Because just keep in mind also that if you uh, start the exam just before the deadline, we're not be we're not be able to help you as well. So the sooner you start the exam, also that gives us opportunity to help you as well to 
to answer any question that you have about the question that you are that we are asking. Okay, so the vast majority are planning to take the exam uh, during the weekend, which is great. Even if you're planning on taking it after the weekend, try to take it on Monday and not wait till the last minute in case there are some technical issues or people's internet connection or something. So I'd recommend taking it as soon as possible just to make sure none of these issues occur. Okay, great. Okay, let's talk about the content of the, of the exam now. So what are the content that's gonna be assessed during the exam? So the midterm uh, consists on four problems. So we're gonna have it from problem one until problem four. So you, you should expect the four problems in the, the midterm exam. And the content, what we will cover is all the material that is uh, from weeks one until week four. So this means the material, the two lessons of week one, two lessons of week two, two lessons of week three, and also the two lessons of week four. So we also provided you with some material in week five a few practical consideration in naval design. That's not gonna be assessed during this test, okay? Remember all the material between, from week one until week, week four. Uh, also uh, keep in mind that the meter is worth a total of 35% of your final grade. So you are, uh, that's an important piece of the final grade. So please take the time to, be, to uh, get prepared and, and do a, a good uh, meter exam. So uh, a couple of considerations as well. So uh, please keep in mind that you cannot complete a time exam using the EDX mobile app. It, it's, it's fine if you watch the video using the app, but you have to use a web browser in order to take a time exam, okay? So that's a, te a technical limitation. You must use a, a web browser, browser. We strongly uh, recommend you to use a computer to complete the, the exam. So that's also a recommendation uh, for you. And finally, um, you can use any any uh, any um, optimization uh, software that you that you consider. So the exam the exam is designed to be solved by by, by Excel. So if you are using Excel, you are good to go. But also we uh, encourage you to use SAS if, if you have the knowledge or even or even Apple. Okay, but to keep in mind that the exam is is designed to be solved by by Excel. But it's up to you to decide the software that are gonna be, gonna be using. I mean, and there's also questions about any other software like LibreOffice. I mean, you're free to use whatever software uh, you prefer. Uh, these, this Excel, SAS, and Apple are recommendations, but yeah, feel free to use any software uh, that you're comfortable with. And also, um, if you can, you can, you're also free to use any code or scripts that you've developed um, in Excel, SAS, Apple, or any other software um, that you've developed in the past for previous problems. Um, feel free to use them in um, the exam as well. Yes, so keep in mind that this is an, um, um, an op op open book uh, exam. Okay, and th that uh, brings me to the second question that I have for you. And the second question is asking about what is the, so the software that you're planning to use for the, of the exam, specifically to solve the optimization problems. And the alternatives are Ample, Excel, Google Sheets, LibreOffice, or SAS Studio. Okay, please provide your input. Okay, we already have more than 30 responses. So the vast majority saying that's gonna be using Excel, which is, uh, which is fine. Some of you are saying SAS Studio around 20%, and just a few are saying that's gonna be uh, using LibreOffice. We didn't, got, uh, we didn't get any, any re responses of people that are gonna be using Ample or Google Sheet, which is also, also fine, okay? Uh, just, I wanna clarify one more point uh, with the time limit of the exam. It's four hours in total, not four hours per problem. So you have four hours for, to complete all the four problems in the exam. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. So basically that means that on average you have to complete each of the problems in our, it roughly in one hour. Okay, so uh, other considerations, please remember that the work must be on your own. So there is no collaboration during the, during the, the exam. Please don't share any comments about the content of the exam with your classmates or even your relatives. The work must be on your own. Additionally, uh, if you have any questions about uh, clarification, please let, let, us, uh, let us know. We're gonna be uh, mo monitoring the email account. So SC2X help at MIT that is you. But keep in mind that these are not meant uh, to answer questions about the content. These are meant to answer questions only about clarifying 
uh, what the what the question is really really asking. Okay, so uh, Akash is going to be monitoring the, this email. Again, just to just to reemphasize uh, his point that we'll only answer questions regarding clarification. We won't answer questions that are asking for hints or on help and how to solve the problem. The only question we'll answer is under, better understanding what the question is asking for. Great. And the final consideration is please do not uh, post any sorry, any questions or any comments in the discussion forum about the exam. So we are going to be also keeping an eye on the discussion forum. Please do not post any questions or comments. And also please do not do it in, in any other website. We're also going to be mon monitoring. So we uh, encourage you to, if you have any, any, any questions, please go to the material, revise the material. And if you have any clarification questions, please let us know and use the SC2X help at MIT, uh, the DDU account. Okay. And with that, uh, let me now uh, move into the main purpose of this live event. It's going to be uh, solving one of the network design uh, problems. So this uh, material was covered in the first in the first two weeks of the of the course, and the problem that I have for you is uh, the following. Uh, before that, let me ask you the following question, and this question is asking about what are some of the challenges that, that you are experienced when are we are solving these uh, type of uh, uh, problems. Okay, and the alternatives that I'm sharing with you basically is. If for you it's difficult to um, define the decision variables, or maybe it's how do you define the objective function, what's the typical objective function for these problems, or even identify the different, the different type of constraints, demand constraints, capacity constraints, the balance constraint, linking, or even the level of severe constraints. I want to hear from you about what is more challenging for you when you are modeling these type of problems. Okay, I think we have a, the, the responses uh, spread more than 20 responses, more than 25 now. So most of you are saying that uh, two thirds are having problems with identifying level of service constraints. Linking constraint as well seems to be um, challenging and also the conservation of flow constraint. I'm gonna be talking particularly uh, in this problem about the conservation and the linking constraint. Seems to be clear uh, the definition of the variables and objective function, but it's something that we emphasize uh, when I'm solving the, the problem. Okay, and demand constraint and capacity constraint seems to be as well uh, uh, fine. Okay, great. Thank you for uh, sharing your, your input. Let me now uh, move to the, to the problem. Okay, and this problem is, it was taken from a, a past meter exam of SC2X, and it's about a company that is called uh, Medico. And Medico basically supplies uh, medications. And the company has a central pharmacy. And from the central pharmacy, uh, it ships the goods to uh, three different distribution centers located in New Jersey, Texas, and Nevada. So the flows goes, the, the, the goods flows uh, from the pharmacy to these three distribution centers. And from there, to four uh, main markets located in the Northeast, uh, Midwest, South, and, and uh, West. Okay, so again, so the flows are gonna be going from the pharmacy to these three distribution centers and from there to four pot potential markets. Okay, uh, for me, it's, it's uh, usually it's a good approach to, uh, to make uh, this diagram because I understand how the material will, uh, will flow in the, in the problem. So I, encourage you to, to, as a first step, please uh, do this kind of diagram. The second thing is uh, usually I collect, I gather all the information that is available to solve the, the problem. In this particular situation, what we know is already what are the origin, the intermediate points, and also the destinations. So we know how the, the material flows for this problem. But also we have information about the transportation costs. So that was given in this problem. So basically how much it will take to move one box from the pharmacy to the different distribution centers. And we can see that these costs are different. So it depends uh, where, the, where, where we are sending the goods. And also we have information about the transportation costs for the second piece to move the goods from the distribution centers 
to the final final markets. Okay, and we can see that each of these arrows or, or each of these transportation costs uh, has a, a different uh, transportation unit transportation cost. Okay, so that information that is is given. We also have information about a fixed cost. This is a fixed cost that we incur every time that we open or, or we run a facility. So it's a, this fixed cost is link is associated with each of the division centers. So we have 15,000 for New Jersey, 10,000 10, for Texas and 20,000 in the case of Nevada. And basically we're gonna be incurring in each of these cost, costs, if we're gonna be opening the facility or, or not. Um, what else? Um, okay, so that's all the information that we, what we have. Additionally, I think we have a demand that we need to satisfy. Okay, so that's uh, the, generally the second step. So gather all relevant information for this, for the problem um, that we are trying to solve. Next, um, we're gonna be deciding what need to be, to be solved. And basically, typically for these types of problems, we have two main decisions to be, to be made. The first decision, it's about the flow. It's basically meaning how much product we're gonna be shipping from the, different, from the different nodes. For this particular problem, we have two types of these decision variables. The first one is what is called inbound flow. Basically, we need to decide how many uh, boxes we're gonna be shipping from the plant sorry, from the ph pharmacy to the different dis distribution centers. So basically we have three of these decision variables. And also we have what is called outbound flow. Basically the flow that goes from the di distribution centers to the different markets. And since we have three distribution centers and we have four markets, we will have a 12 or three times four uh, different uh, values for these decision variables. Okay, so we have, this is the first set of uh, variables. The, the flow, and we have two types, inbound and out, outflow. So in total, we will have 12 plus three, 15 of these uh, flow variables. The second decision to be made, it's about if we are keeping or reopen a facility, at least in this case, or not. Since we have three distribution centers, we have to make three different decisions, one for each of these distribution centers, and the way to incorporate this is using this binary constraint. Zero, meaning that we are, we are not opening the facility, and one meaning that we decided to open the, the facility, okay? And just to clarify, so this is the binary constraint, and all the flow variables are gonna be, uh, typically gonna be integers, because we are shipping, in this case, uh, boxes. <clears throat> What's gonna be the objecting function? So typ typically in this uh, type of problems, what we aim to do is to minimize total cost. And for this problem, the total cost is gonna be composed for two uh, cost components. The first one is gonna be the transportation cost. Remember, I just show you and um, share with you the transportation cost uh, for each of the, of the legs. So basically we're gonna be multiplying each unit transportation cost by the amount that we are uh, shipping from the, different, from the different nodes. So that's the first component, the transportation cost. And the second component is gonna be the fixed cost basically the cost that we're gonna be incurring if we open the different distribution center. Okay, so what uh, we have done so far, we have a diagram of the, of the problem, we have collected information about uh, the different data that was available. Then we set the decision variables, two types, and also we set the objective function. We're trying to minimize the total, the total cost, which is composed by transportation cost, plus the fixed cost. Okay, and the final piece is regarding the limitation or basically trying to answer what are the constraints to solve this, this problem? What are the limitations to solve this problem? And typically we have uh, some constraints. The first demand is associated with the demand. So that's also information that was given. So basically we need to satisfy a specific demand for each of the, of the markets. And these are the numbers you can see in the, on the screen, the numbers in, in number of, of boxes. And that's the, thing, the, first, the, the, the very first constraint. We need to satisfy the demand, okay? So basically all the, all the, the goods that are shipped to the different demand nodes should be equal to the demand of the, of the node. For, in this case, in the case of, for example, the, the south, 
the south market, all the goods that are coming into this market should be equal, greater or equal to the demand that I have. So that's typically the first set of constraints, demand constraints. How many demand constraints will have? As many demand, demand points as we have. In this particular problem, we have four markets, so we'll have four uh, demand constraints. The second capacity, the, so the second constraint is related to the capacity of the distribution centers. That was also given in this problem. We have one a maximum capacity associated with each of the three distribution centers. And that's something that we also need to uh, satisfy. Basically, all, the, all the, the goods that are coming into the distribution centers should be less or equal to this maximum capa capacity. Since we have three different, different distribution centers, we'll need three of these capacity constraints. There's no capacity constraint related to the pharmacy, so we are free to uh, ship or send as many goods as we, as we, as we can. Okay, a third type of a uh, typical constraint are what is called conservation of flow constraint or balance constraint. And this typically um, happens when we have some transshipment points. Basically, when we have nodes uh, in which we receive some goods and then we send to other location. And as you can see in the, in the, in the picture, in the diagram, the nodes that are playing this transshipment role are the dis distribution centers. They are receiving goods from the pharmacy and then they are sending those goods uh, to the different markets. Okay, since we have these transshipment points, we need to use this conservation of flow constraint. And this conservation of flow constraint, basically what it's saying is all the goods that, were, that we are receiving that are coming in to each of the distribution center should be equal to the, to the flow that is going out. So basically the inflow should be e equal to the outflow. How many of these uh, constraints will we have? As many as transshipment points we have. Since we have three DCs that act as transshipment points, we'll have three of these uh, constraints, one for each distribution center. Then uh, we'll have the linking constraints. That's also an important uh, piece. And this piece is basically, or you know, this type of constraints we need when we have a combination of flow, flow variables and also binary variables. So the, the function of these uh, constraints, as the name says, is to link the variable constraint, so the flow constraint with the binary constraint. So, and basically the meaning of this constraint is if we are shipping goods through each of, for, for, through a distribution center is because we decided to open that, that facility. So basically we're making sure that the value for the decision variable is gonna be one. And that's what the linking constraint is, is, is doing, okay? So that's the, 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 the typical. So for this particular problem, we have not uh, considered the, consider the um, level of service constraint because the problem is not as quick as so. Okay, so what are the questions of the, the problem? The first one is uh, how many DCs should uh, the company open in order to minimize costs? Okay, so basically we have, remember that we have three distribution centers. So the problem is asking how many of these we should open. And the second one is asking about what is the, op the optimal annual cost. Okay, and let me show you uh, how I organize uh, all the, this information in a Excel spreadsheet. So basically uh, everything that is uh, colored in gray is the information that was given. So we have from cells uh, D11 to the D13, we have the fixed cost. From cells D19 to D21, we have the unit transportation cost, the inbound unit transportation cost. And from cells uh, C35 to F37, so we have the unit transportation cost for the outbound. We also have information about the capacity that is in these parts in column I and uh, the demand that is in, co in row uh, 31, okay? So everything that is colored in gray is the input information that was, was known. I also color in uh, yellow all the decision variables, the two types. On one end, we have the binary variables in these in this parts from cell C11 to uh, C13. 
uh, and the inbound, sorry, the flow variables are divided. So I have one for inbound, another for outbound. So the inbound uh, flow variables are in cells C19 to C21. And finally, the outbound are, are from C, cell C26 until uh, cell F28. And as you can see also in this screenshot, you can see the main, uh, the main constraints. So the demand constraint, capacity constraint, the linking constraint, and also the, val the balance uh, constraint. After uh, just using the, the solver, the Excel solver, this is the result that I, uh, that I got, okay? So to answer the first question is how many uh, distribution centers we should open? So the solution is saying that we should open three of them. So basically we're opening all the available distribution centers. And the second question was the cost. The cost, uh, as you can see, was composed by three components. First one is the fixed cost. Since we are opening the three, the, the three facilities, so the, the fixed cost is gonna be the sum of the three individual fixed costs. Then we have transportation costs, which is divided by inbound and outbound transportation costs. So the three, so the sum of these three cost components is gonna be the total cost, okay? In this case, uh, $390,900, okay? And that's uh, how we solve this, this, this problem. Okay, the second question, and, and with that, I'm gonna be ending my, my participation in this, in this piece, is saying the following. The company uh, finds uh, that building the DC in Texas is not an option due to state regulation. So basically we cannot open a, a distribution center in Texas. And basically is asking what would be the, the up, optimal annual cost under this condition. Okay, and with that, uh, I will uh, ask this question to you. So basically uh, what we are saying is, okay, we cannot open a facility, we cannot open a distribution center in Texas. And the question for you is gonna be, uh, okay, how do you model this situation? And we have a couple of options. First option is to start modeling from scratch, okay? So we have to repeat everything and create an uh, Excel spreadsheet from, from scratch. The second option is modifying the initial model, just removing information related to the distribution center in Texas, okay? So uh, remove all information in the original spreadsheet that it's about Texas. And uh, the final option is add an extra constraint to make sure that the DC in Texas is not open, okay? Adding a, a constraint. Let me tell you that the three options are, are valid, but of course there are there one that is uh, more efficient. And let's see your, your answer. So we have almost uh, 30 responses. Some of you are saying that around 10% that start, start uh, from scratch would be a good option. 13% 13, 13 is saying that modify the initial model. And the vast majority around 75% uh, is saying that we need to add a constraint. I would say that that's the most efficient, um, efficient way to go, just add a, a constraint. And we have a couple of op options to do, to do so. Okay, so typically keep in mind that we are not allowed now to open Texas. So one way to go would be, okay, so we need to force the value of this cell, the cell C12 to be equal to zero. And that's what I'm doing here, okay? Specifically, now we are forcing to make this value zero, meaning that we are not opening a, uh, the diffusion center located in Texas, okay? That's one alternative using, just adding a constraint. Another alternative would be instead of ad adding a constraint, so we might also modify the fixed cost, okay? So now the fixed cost is 10,000. So we might increase and use a really big number, for example, 1 million. Okay, if you use $1 million as a fixed call for Texas, so the model, since this is a minimization uh, objective model, will force not to open this, this facility. Okay, and that will be a second, a second alternative to uh, solve this problem. And this will be uh, the solution. So you can see that now the value for the, 
decision variable associated with Texas is now uh, is now zero. Okay, and with that, uh, I will open to any any questions. Do you have yeah. some questions? There's a few questions. Um, okay, one of them is uh, back to the arc flow. I guess you can open that again. Um, sure. The arc flow diagram. Um, they want to know where the balance constraints are in the arc flow diagram. You just talk over that. Okay, sure. I'm gonna be sharing again my my screen. The linking constraint, the conservation. Uh, the balance constraint. Okay. Okay, the balance constraints are the conservation of flow constraints. Okay, so they are synonyms. Balance or conservation con con flow constraints are exactly the same. Meaning that everything, so for every trans transshipment point, all the inflow, all the, in all the flow that is coming into the facility should go out. Okay, so the inflow should be equal to the outflow. So basically, the value of this decision variable of this arrow should be equal to the sum of these three or four arrows. Okay, so that's the balance constraint. Perfect. Um, and the other question, I think this is an interesting one. A big question is uh, regarding constraints like uh, capacity and demand. Uh, in some cases, we see that the solution uses equal, and in some cases, we see it uses less than or greater than. So, what's a guideline to um, use for that? Okay, so typically I would recommend use um, to use the the equal. So we tend to use the greater or equal because that's uh, computationally more efficient. So meaning that the solver that are using your computer will find the solution in a more efficient way. However, particularly in this kind of problems, if we use the greater or equal, when we have the level of service constraint, uh, we might we might exceed the demand. Okay, so in order to fulfill the level of service constraint, so we might send we might send more goods that are allowed. So that's why, in order to have the optimal um, or the yeah the, the the minimum cost solution, I recommend you to use the equal the equal sign for the demand constraint. Okay, perfect. Okay, more question. Uh, no. okay. Okay, so let's uh, move, move on. Now it's gonna be the turn of uh, Akash. Right. Okay, and I'm sharing my screen. Okay. All right, so I'll be going over the fixed planning horizon model uh, question. It's a practice question that uh, you can use for the exam. Uh, so just a quick look at what the problem is. Uh, so we're uh, looking at a problem for Alta Poli. Uh, there are concrete electric pole manufacturer and distributor in northern in the northern city of Monterey, Mexico. Um, they have six uh, steps in their production process. And once their concrete poles are produced, they're sent to warehouses uh, located in different parts of the city uh, that are strate strategically located to uh, ensure uh, that they can reach different, different markets. Uh, so one of the key decisions that they need our help with is uh, figuring out how many um, like what number of concrete poles need to be produced each week. Um, and the company has a fixed planning horizon for six weeks that shows the demand or the forecast for the next six weeks as shown in the table. So as you can see, um, for the weeks one to six, you have uh, a forecasted demand of how many poles uh, will be required by the market in these six weeks. Um, and a couple of, they give us some initial data as well. They say that the initial inventory is zero. And they also have some information on their holding cost, which is, uh, $1 per poll per week for the first three weeks, and then $1.5 per poll per week for the next three weeks. Uh, similarly, with the setup cost, they also uh, anticipate an increase in the last three weeks. So initially setup cost, uh, so is $250 per setup. Uh, by setup cost, we mean that each cycle of production, no matter how many they produce in that period, they have to pay 250 it's somewhat of a fixed cost uh, for a given period, as long as they're producing something. So it's 250 for the first three weeks and 300 for the next three weeks. All right, so the first uh, method they uh, wanna use, so this is what they traditionally use is lot for lot or L for L. And they, they wanna use the defined production lot sizes. Uh, and using this approach, they wanna figure out what the total cost would be of manufacturing concrete poles in these next six weeks. And by total cost, we mean the sum of setup and holding costs here. So this is quite easy. Uh, we know that since we're producing lot for lot, we're only producing as much as to cover that specific week's requirement. So 
So if we go back here in each week, we're only producing as much as the forecast is for that week. So in week one, we'll be producing 1497, week two, 115, week three, 708, and so on. So as such, you have no holding cost, no excess inventory, which leads to no holding cost. So the only cost component in the total cost uh, equation we have here is setup cost, which as I said, is $250 for the first three weeks and $300 for the next three weeks, leading to a total of 1650. So this is a quite easy uh, problem since we're using lot for lot, there's no inventory, so no holding cost. The only thing we're looking at is setup costs and how uh, they add up over the six week period. Great. All right, so this is, it gets a little more interesting here. Uh, now they want to look at some different methods uh, to see what uh, the production lot sizes should be. Uh, they want to try and see how the silver meal method looks uh, and using this method, what the total cost would be. Again, uh, the total cost here we mean is the sum of the setup and the holding cost. Uh, and they want to know what the total cost would be uh, across the next six weeks for manufacturing these poles. So the basic idea of um, the silver mill method is uh, we look at the next period's forecast demand, this period, uh, if it reduces the average cost per period. Uh, and our goal here is to minimize the TRC per unit time, uh, which is uh, the TRC for a given time period divided by N. So this is the algorithm we use uh, to go over the silver meal method. Uh, so we start at T equals one and we set N equals zero. Here we calculate the TRC per unit time. Then we add, uh, we make N equals N plus one. So now N becomes, N becomes one. And we calculate what the TRC uh, per unit time would be at this uh, time period. And we notice that if the TRC uh, is greater at the next time period than the previous time period, we place an order in the time period T for the quantity equal to the forecasted demand of periods from T to T plus N minus one. Uh, and we set T equals T plus N to go back to step two and start this process again. If it doesn't, if TRC uh, per unit time at T plus N is not greater than uh, TRC per unit time at T plus N minus one, we go back to step four and continue the process. Uh, so that's an algorithm, but I'll show you an example of how uh, this is calculated. So let's start here. So we see that uh, we have the forecast, the setup costs and the holding costs uh, for each of the six weeks for these uh, electric poles. And we can look at the, the total uh, relevant cost here across the six time periods. Uh, so we start here at this 250 number. So this is uh, the cost of producing uh, forecasted poles for week one, averaged over one time period. Then according to the algorithm, we could keep going. Uh, we look at uh, time period to add that demand in also and see if we produce uh, the demand for week one and week two together and average it over time, two time periods, what the total uh, average total cost would be. And that's 182.5 okay. since. So, sorry guys. so in this case, since we're producing for weeks one and two, mm -hmm. so that, mean, that means that we are uh, including a setup cost uh, no, so we would only include setup costs uh, once since we're producing all of it together. Correct. Uh, but the week two demand that we have will incur holding costs for that one week. So exactly. basically this 182.5 that is averaged over these two weeks is basically uh, one setup cost of 250 uh, plus uh, holding cost for these 115 poles that we have to hold for one week until we enter week two, averaged over two time periods. Perfect. Uh, a good clarification. Uh, but given that uh, the TRC per unit time at two is uh, less than one, we continue going as per the algorithm. So we continue the same thing here. So this assumes that this 592 number basically says that we produce uh, the forecast demand for all three time periods, one, two, and three in time period one. So that's one set of cost. Plus we uh, account for a holding cost of these 115 poles for one week and these 708 poles for two weeks since we're producing all of that one and average that over three time periods. Now that we note that this is higher than, uh, the TRC here is higher than here. So we, that's our break point. And we say that we produce uh, the demand for weeks one and two in time period one and start again at time period three to continue with the algorithm. So you continue with that to figure out uh, how much we produce in each week and with that, we can get our total cost of 1505. Okay, so basically the solution in this case would be 
to produce in week one mm -hmm. for week one and two of yeah. course then producing week uh, three just for the for yeah. week three and then producing week four for weeks four and five and producing week uh, six exactly and that's what the total cost would also tell you so we said that we produce for weeks one and two in week one because your break point is here then you continue with the algorithm starting at three your break point becomes here because this is higher than this so that's your break points you produce week three's production in week three or week three's demand in week three then you continue with um week four week five and week six and that's how you get uh your total um uh, production, which then leads to your total cost, uh, accounting for inventory costs and setup costs accordingly. Okay, great. Perfect. And the last method that the company wants to try out and see is the optimal method. And in this case, they don't want to know the total cost, but rather how much should be produced in each week. So there's two ways to do uh, the optimal method. We can either use a multi uh, integer linear program or use the Wagner within method, uh, the algorithm to solve this problem. So that's what we use here. Um, so just to go over what the algorithm says, so we start at time t equals one and we find the cost for ordering just enough to satisfy that given time period. And then we look at all the past orders until uh, time equals t equals one and find if we add those, add that demand uh, on and uh, produce it in one order, would that reduce our, uh, reduce our cost? Uh, and you keep going until, uh, until t equals n and then you can figure out um, what the lowest cost option would be to, um, to meet this optimal method uh, algorithm. Uh, I guess so this, again, this would be better illustrated by an example. So um, in week one, as we have nothing before and we have to cover the demand for week one, we produce all the demand for week one in week one. So that incurs a setup cost of 250, but no holding cost since we're satisfying all the demand for week one. Uh, now we move on to looking at the demand for week two. We have two options here. One is to produce the demand for week two within week one itself. So which means we would occur the, incur the $250. Uh, note that this is all total cost. So it's the cost for all the uh, demands together. So uh, at 365, this means that we would incur a setup cost of 250 plus a holding cost for these 115 uh, polls for a week. That's 250 plus 365. The other option we have is um, produce the demand for week two in week two, which means it would occur a 250, incur a $250 um, setup cost in week one, plus a $250 setup in week two, leading to 500. And we noticed that 365 is the lesser of the two options, meaning that this is what we would go with. Now we can move to week three and keep going the same way. So in week three, we see that at 1781, this means that we're producing uh, the demand for weeks one, two, and three, in week one. So here we would incur a setup cost of 250 plus a holding cost for one week for these 155 poles plus a holding cost for two weeks for these 708 poles leading to 1781. Now the other option here is that uh, we continue producing week one and week two's demand in week one. So that's 365. And we uh, produce these 708 units in week two and incur a holding cost for one week leading to 101208. The third and the cheapest option here with these numbers is that we produce week one and week two in week one, incur the holding cost for one week, and then produce week three's units in week three, leading to just an extra setup cost here with no holding cost for week three's units, leading to 615, which is the cheapest option. Uh, so this is how you would go forward to see what you would produce in each week. And leading to the answers then, we see that, as I mentioned, we produce week one and week two uh, units in week one, then we move on to week three, produce week three's units in week three, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is an algorithm you can use to um, figure out the optimal method, uh, what the optimal method or the optimal solution would be for uh, this production, or you can also use a multi integer linear program as mentioned in the course. Okay, great, thank you, thank you guys. So in this case, the optimal, phone, the optim optimal uh, total cost was uh, uh, that value, right? Yeah. So we have a uh, 15.05. So how much was it using the, the other one? The silver and mirror? I was exactly the same. Okay, which, which doesn't happen every time. Mm -hmm. So of course with the optimal method, you will get, you will get always the, the best solution, the optimal solution. 
and the silver, silver and meal method is just an heuristics, okay? Meaning that you will get a, a good solution. Sometimes it's gonna be the optimal, but not always, okay? Perfect. Um, so let just to take a look at any questions that might have come up. Yes. Um, okay, so we'll open to any, any questions uh, that you have. Please now is the time about the, the content or about the logistics of, of the exam. Okay. Um, so just a quick question about um, the attempts in the exam and uh, how they're creating them. I, I, I guess you mentioned this, but I guess let's reiterate this point. Um, so yeah, you will have two attempts in most questions on, unless it's otherwise mentioned that you only have one attempt. But again, you won't be able to see whether your first attempt was right or wrong. You would receive no instant feedback. The only reason we give you two attempts is in case you make a typo with the first attempt or something like that. Uh, so yeah, you won't see any feedback, but um, yeah, you will still have two attempts unless otherwise mentioned. Yeah, that's correct. Um, and whether this uh, live event is going to be recorded and uh, can we access, yes, it's being recorded to YouTube and we'll share the link on the course very soon. Yes, and also we will be sharing the, the slide that we use with the yeah. calculation. So there's the slides and also the, the Excel file. So that's going to be available for you in week number five uh, under the tab live event. Okay. Yeah. And um, also, um, there's no feedback before or after the exam. Um, so, the flip, so, so you won't be able to see what uh, questions you did right or wrong. Uh, all you'll be able to see is your final score at the end and we'll be able to provide no feedback or no specific question feedback for any of the exam questions since the purpose of the exam is just to assess your knowledge and not uh, in terms of learning or anything. Yes, so also the, uh, let, me, let me mention that the progress bar is gonna be disabled during the, during the week that the exam is, is open. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's another question asking whether there'll be resources available over the weekend to answer questions about the exam. Uh, yes, I'll be monitoring the email uh, many times or a few times at least uh, over the weekend. Obviously, I won't be able to respond immediately. Uh, but yeah, send the questions as soon as possible. I'd recommend sending, uh, looking through the exam first, seeing what questions you may have and sending so that I still have those, you still have those four hours instead of waiting to the last question to send me an email and then you don't have much time uh, to wait for the response. Um, and yeah, there's another question about time constraint for any particular problem. No, there's no time constraint per problem. The Correct. time constraint is for the whole exam is four hours. You're free to spend as much time as you want on each problem as long as the total across the four problems does not exceed four hours. Yes. Um, yeah, will this case study be available in PDF form for practice? Yes, it will. We'll upload it very shortly. The slides? The slides? Yes. Yeah. Um, will there be provided sanity checks in the questions? No, I think we don't have any sanity check in the in the in the questions for this particular exam. No, we don't have. Um, yeah, and will any model data be provided in spreadsheets, or will be inputting in all? Um, I think all the data sh uh, you would need to make your own spreadsheet model and input all of it uh, in the spreadsheet. I don't think. Yeah, but we don't have programs that that involve a lot of a lot, yeah. a lot of data. You will see yeah. that we have maybe metrics with a two times yeah. five, so with 10 values, yeah. but no more than that. And a lot of it is already in table format, so you can just copy paste it. Correct, that is what, what we recommend to you. Just yeah. copy and paste what you have in the, in the, in the website. Yeah, uh, do we get hints at the beginning with zero points like we got in the practice problems? No, I, I think there's no sanity check questions. There's still, uh, no. they're straight the, um, Okay. And regarding the last comment, silver meal is optimal. Isn't it that they give the both the same minimum cost, but the decision variables could be different? Uh, yes, I believe so. So uh, if, the, if the decision variables are different, so that means that the the total cost might be also different, right? Okay. So, but just keep in mind again. So the optimal methods, so the work that we seen will, or or the 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 meal formulation will give you the optimal solution, meaning that's going to be the least a total cost. In the okay. case of silver, silver and meal, that's an heuristics, meaning that is an algorithm that will provide a good response, a good answer. But not always the case is going to be the optimal. Okay, so typically, so the optimal or the what we see is going to be always getting, always getting the optimal solution and silver and meal is going to be something close to the, to the optimal solution, a good solution. Yep. Um, will the exam be all model based or will there be conceptual questions as well? I think there's conceptual questions as well. Yes, yeah, so we'll have one problem that's gonna be for this type of, of uh, questions, conceptual problems. So one of problem of conceptual and the other three is gonna be a more uh, qualitative uh, calculations. Regarding the data provided, if it contains decimal values, can it also be provided also with a comma as separator? 
I think with Excel, with like, using a comma separator, it might uh, take that differently versus the decimal. So I think all our data provided will be an actual decimal point when it uh, uses decimals. Yes, yeah, so we have. For, I think we have for the for the distances um, yeah. might might have some, but also for the cost. So we are providing just the, yeah. the decimal point. Yeah. But what will be the recommendation in that case? Just to uh, copy and paste. Just to copy and paste, and I mean, if your Excel uses commas as decimals, it will recognize. Um, either you can recognize, or if it doesn't recognize, you can just manually change. So there's yeah. not many data points. I mean, the exam is. Uh, I, I think if I remember correctly, uh, the number of data points is much smaller than what you see on GAs or yeah, that's problems. Correct. So yeah, uh, it's meant to test your knowledge, not meant to do tedious repetitive work. So, correct. All right, I think that's all the questions. Um, if you guys have any more questions, please feel free to reach out via email. Uh, it's sc2xhelp at mit.edu. Uh, or you can, uh, if you have any conceptual questions that are not relating to something graded, please feel free to use the discussion forums and uh, one of us will answer you there. Okay, awesome, thank Perfect. you, thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. Uh, great seeing everyone here and good luck on the exam. Okay, thank you all for attending this live event. So one more time. So this material is gonna be the, the video and also the, the slides and the Excel is gonna be available for you after we finish this live event. And the best of luck in the Emitter exam. All right, thank See you, you next time. Bye -bye.